you find a red card on your seat. Have a look and raise the card if you agree. Does sex matter? Uh, not everybody seems to be convinced, okay. Yes, sex matters, but gender matters too. Sex and gender define the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we look, but also the way we are looked at. They influence the opportunities we are offered and the risks we take. But today I will be talking about how sex and gender matter to our health. I will be talking both about sex and gender. You see, sex is biological, gender is social, but it is complicated. HIV is a prime example of the complex interaction between sex and gender. Now, some of you are probably too young to remember the HIV epidemic in the 80s. I was an HIV scientist when I first come, uh, came to realize how sex and gender affect people's lives. Did you know, for example, that young women are twice as likely to become HIV infected compared to young men? Women are at greater risk for HIV infection, and there are both biological as well as social reasons for it. Biologically, women are more exposed to HIV during sex because of the larger surface of vagina and cervix compared to the areas of the male genital tract where HIV transmission occurs. In addition, they're also exposed to a larger volume of seminal fluid during sex. But in addition to these biological sex differences, women, there are a number of gender-related socioeconomic factors that make women more vulnerable to HIV, such as sexual violence, refusal of their male partners to use condom, lack of economic power, or limited education to know how to prevent HIV. But gender inequality affects men and boys negatively too. The notion of masculinity can push men and boys to take unnecessary risks, such as having multiple sexual partners or not using condom. They're also expected to be tough and strong, making them reluctant to seek medical care, care resulting in late HIV diagnosis and treatment. But these fundamental sex and gender-based differences are everywhere, across all diseases. To give you a couple of more examples, did you know that women suffer more of sport injuries than men? Women, for example, are six times more likely than men to have injury in their knee ligaments. Or did you know that men with anorexia go unnoticed because having an eating disorder has been characterized as feminine and seeking psychological help as unmanly. So you see, the entire medicine and the medical field is gendered. So what's the problem then? The problem is that we have enough evidence to know that sex and gender matter to our health, but we are doing very little to understand the underlying reasons for that and respond to these differences appropriately. And we are facing a myriad of problems. As an illustration, we have now discovered that more women die of heart disease than men. In fact, heart disease is the leading cause of death among women worldwide. One of the reasons is that symptoms for heart attack was developed based on men, but it shows that women present very different symptoms. So it takes longer time for them to seek care, and when they do, they may go misdiagnosed or do not receive the right treatment at the right time. Another widely used uh, example, or widely known example, is drug development. In the United States, of 10 drugs that were withdrawn from the market, eight were withdrawn because they were causing more harm to women. In another instance, the US Food and Drug Administration, the authority responsible for approving medicines before they are introduced to the market, reduced the dose of the widely used drug Ambien to half 
but only for women. No changes for men. Women metabolize the drug differently and need only half the dose for the same effect. Isn't that surprising or isn't that rather scary that these fundamental differences are discovered after a drug has been tested, approved, introduced to the market, prescribed by doctors and used by us? These are for drugs that half of the population use. Why this gender bias? Well, it appears that in medicine, the white male body has been the point of reference. Here we go. Meaning that anyone that shows different symptoms or responds to treat differently than the average white male may go misdiagnosed or treated wrongly. I couldn't understand why it was so difficult for researchers to rec recognize and acknowledge and examine these important differences. After all, this is a well-known fact. Already in 1973, in the oldest medical journal, The Lancet, an article highlights how sex and gender influences across medicine and how little we know. And today, Researchers still fail to think that sex and gender matter until they stumble upon it. So let me give you a personal anecdote here. My husband is a surgeon. More precisely, he operates patients with the cancer of the esophagus. He's also a researcher. I have been trying since the beginning of time to convince him to look at the differences between male and female patients. And he has persistently claimed that there are no differences in outcome. Until recently, he comes home one night and rather awkwardly says, we have found these findings at my clinic, which are very bizarre. I bet you'd be happy to hear about it. Well, that sounded odd. And then he continues, <coughs> by a mere coincidence, we have now noticed that our female patients have fewer complications after an operation are doing better. And we just can't figure out why. Wow, I was really excited. I was happy because he finally admitted that I was right. <laughs> Although he should have known that I'm always right. <laughs> but imagine. Imagine if they do figure out why their female patients are doing better. They could improve the survival of their male patients based on what they learn from their female patients. Examining these differences is beneficial for everybody. But medical research, which is meant to answer a question if a treatment or a drug work, often doesn't include enough women to be able to examine these differences. My team and I looked at a sample of HIV drug clinical trials. Clinical trials of drugs are designed to answer the question if a drug is safe and effective compared to a placebo. In our sample of over 95,000 patients that were included in these trials, only about a quarter were women. More surprisingly, of about 500 scientific articles that reported the results of these clinical trials, only 17% mentioned sex or gender. At that time, I was started thinking about what could I do about this gender bias? At the time, I was an editor of a medical journal, of an HIV journal. Medical journals are important because research findings are communicated to the greater medical community and public through publication of scientific articles. As a medical editor, I had an opportunity to make a difference. So I decided to introduce a gender policy. I decided to ask my authors to mention how many men, how many women, and if included in their study, how many transgender persons participated in their research and also describe if they looked at any differences among these groups, and if not, explain why. It's quite simple, right? But for any idea to enable a profound change, it needs to be replicated. So I approached a few other editors of other HIV journals, and suddenly we were a handful of journals uh, acknowledging and embracing the importance of sex and gender in HIV research. 
As I grew more and more interested in this topic, I came across a really fascinating example about how sex and gender affect us and affect our lives and health beyond medicine. And I'd love to share a couple of these with you. Some of them are really eye-opening. I came across this study that looked at whiplash injuries. <coughs> Now, whiplash is an injury to the neck caused by rapid, forceful back and, move, uh, back and forth movement in car accidents. This study showed that women suffer two to three times more of whiplash than men, and they take longer to recover. Do you know why? Listen to this. They found out that the crash test dummies used by car manufacturers to test the safety, safety of the car seat features were based on white male models. Isn't that fascinating how not thinking about the differences between women and men's anatomy can ha come at a very huge cost to women and society? Now, I would like to take you to a study about hurricanes. Now, you probably wonder, what have hurricanes have to do with sex and gender? Right? Well, you all have heard about Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane Irma, and the damages that they cause. Well, this study looked at strong hurricanes of same intensity and showed that hurricanes with, male, with female names tend to be deadlier than hurricanes <laughs> from male names. The authors conclude that individuals simply underestimate the strength of the hurricane and their vulnerability to it if the hurricane has a more feminine name compared to, to when it has a more masculine name. Isn't that just fascinating how we are subconsciously affected by the gender roles and expectations that we have created in our society? Well, as I came across these examples, I was even more convinced that we had to do things differently. We had to change minds. So I started thinking, so why not think big? Why not try to encourage all scientific journals across discipline, beyond medicine, to introduce a gender policy? So I set up a gender policy committee. I brought together a group of like-minded, committed, driven, researchers, doctors, editors, science communicators, under the umbrella of European Association of Science Editors. Together, we embarked on a journey. We were all volunteering on top of our daily jobs. We were using our spare time and our own resources. And it took us over two years to develop a set of guidelines which we called Sex and Gender Equity in Research, the Sager Guidelines. We thought it was an appropriate name. We had to be Sager in the way we did research and reported it. The Sager guidelines provide a set of clear and simple instructions to authors and researchers. We provide a set of recommendations, but the three main points are always mention the sex or gender of your subject in your research. If you're using animals, cells, or tissues, you need to mention the sex. If you're developing an app or a technology, you need to mention if it's going to be applying on both men and women. Two, always disaggregate your data by sex, meaning that present your data separately for men and women, and if included in your study, transgender persons. And finally, and most importantly, analyze your data with a gender lens. Look at differences. Look at biological differences if you're in medicine. Look at gender-based differences. And if you do not look at any differences between the sexes and the genders, you better have a good excuse, and we want to hear that. The SAGER guidelines were launched in 2016, and it has received a lot of attention. More and more journals are endorsing it or translating it into other languages. But we have a long way to go. There is still a lot of resistance to change. But now I'm confident. I'm confident that the change is possible and is happening. There is increasing number of researchers, doctors, patients who are aware of these important differences and demanding a change. And I want to invite you to join this movement. You can make a difference. While you may choose different career paths, we all have something in common. 
We all have a sex and we all have a gender. And we are all patients and consumers, protective of our health and that of our loved ones. So demand evidence. Question current practice. Drive a change. Let's together put on our gender lens and make sure healthcare and our society is based on evidence and benefit all. Today we know that every cell is sexed. Today we know that everybody is gendered. This is no longer a question. Today we know that sex and gender matter. Thank you. Thank you.